We're going to start uh, our next session, and uh, the first speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce Kwa Klee, um, who is a researcher at Google Brain, and um, who you may not know, uh, was named in 2014 uh, one of the top innovators under 35 by MIT Tech Review. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kwa Klee. I'm a member of the Google Brain team in uh, Mountain View. Um, uh, in this talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my uh, recent work with some of my colleagues uh, in using um, reinforcement learning uh, to uh, design neural network architectures. Um, so uh, one of the most important results uh, in the last few years uh, in deep learning, uh, uh, in my opinion, it is the use of convolutional neural networks for images. And uh, this uh, started in 2012, maybe a little bit earlier too, um, and especially in, uh, when they use it for ImageNet uh, competition. And um, started in 2012 with AlexNet and uh, um, all the way to now, we, use, we have better and better neural networks. And uh, if you see the figure on the left, uh, you see that the progress of uh, ac the top one accuracy of uh, human design neural networks over time. And uh, this progress has always has been always about how to design better neural networks and better training schemes for, neural net uh, for convolutional neural networks. And you can go from 55% to more than 80% with just better architectures. Um, and if you look closely into uh, Inception V4, which is the network that got 80%, you will see the network uh, can become quite com complex. Uh, so um, the Inception V4 uh, is composed of a bunch of uh, modules called the Inception modules. And in the Inception module, we see a lot, bunch of average pooling, convolution, and et cetera. So it can be quite complex. Um, so when I thought about this, I said, if this is the future of computer vision, there would be no chance that I can contribute, contribute to uh, this uh, research area because it's so complex. It takes so many uh, years of human expertise to design good architecture like this. Um, so uh, we just recently started uh, using more automated methods to design neural architectures. And um, the key idea is that, um, the key observation is that even though uh, neural architectures can be complex, they can be thought of as programs uh, or like configuration strings. So let's suppose that I have this configuration string called filter width of five, filter height of three, and number of filters of 24. I can kind of reconstruct like one layer in the neural net. Uh, so the idea is to use an INN to write out this configuration string. And, uh, and then when you write out that configuration string, there, uh, you need a parser to pass that configuration string to construct a neural network. And then you take that configuration ne uh, conf uh, a neural network and train it to the end, uh, and then uh, validate it on a validation set. And then you get a reward signal. And then you use the reward signal to feedback into the controller so that the controller can improve over time. So the picture of uh, the uh, method will look like this. So we have two systems. One is the controller, which proposes machine learning models. And machine learning model will be trained and then evaluated. Some of them will be good, and some of them will be very bad. And the good ones will give positive feedback to the controller, and the bad one will give negative feedback to the controller so that over time the controller will sample better and better architectures. Uh, so in our framework, the controller, again, is like an, uh, is an, a recurrent neural network. Uh, and in particular, we use uh, uh, the long short-term memory network. Uh, and um, uh, the way it works is for following. So we dis divide the network into a bunch of layers. So we have layer n minus 1, layer n, and then layer n plus 1. And in every layer, you have some a uh, particular configura configuration that the, the neural net has to specify. For example, it has to spe specify the filter height, filter width, stripe height, stripe width, and etc. Um, 
And, for, uh, and then the way we train it is basically using uh, reinforce or other policy gradient methods. And uh, first of all, we have the uh, um, first we have the reward is basically the accuracy of the architecture on the held out validation set. And then the parameter of the controller will be optimized using reinforce. And then we can use reinforce to expand the rule and um, uh, compute the gradient and train the controller. And uh, 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 in our, f um, f mm, so the first experiment we conducted was on uh, optimizing uh, convolutional nets for CIFAR 10. And uh, we, um, we have to predict the, the, uh, the filter width, filter height, stride width, stride height, and number of filters per layer. For example, um, filter height, we can select the soft max, can select between one, three, five, seven, and then filter width, uh, the soft max can select between one, three, five, seven, and stride height, stride width, and etc. For example, if the controller for this particular layer write down the string three, seven, one, two, and thirty-six, what that means is the filter height is three, and filter width is seven. Stride height is one, and stride width is two, and the number of filters is 36. That's basically what the controller should write. And then it will concatenate these strings for a longer network so that you end up with a bigger neural network. Um, and uh, we uh, conducted a massive experiment on this. So we, uh, we use 800 GPUs uh, concurrently at one time. And, um, uh, the each uh, try network was trained like 50 epochs, and we ran for the total number of models that we trained was uh, 12,000 try models. And uh, in our system, we have uh, because uh, we run 400, G, uh, 400 G, 800 GPUs concurrently, we break it down into multiple repli replica and then the replica will uh, communicate to a parameter server for the controller so that the controller. Um, can asynchronously update the parameter so that it can sample better architectures over time. Um, so uh, when we first applied this to CIFAR 10, uh, we end up, ended up with uh, accuracy of uh, 3.65 accuracy, uh, uh, sorry, error rate on the, um, um, on the data set. And uh, this is basically uh, on par or slightly better than most of the architectures that human invented. And uh, the architecture um, that uh, the network, uh, the controller it, it basically ended up uh, predicting was this kind of network architecture. So I didn't talk about too much about the, um, the skip connection, but in our controller, you can also have a node to predict what layer before that it can uh, connect the input to. So it can choose not to connect to any input or any layer before, or it could predict one layer. And the controller basically uh, selects uh, many uh, skip connections. Uh, and, um, and we also ran a control experiment where we actually uh, manually connect all layers to all layers, uh, uh, all other layers, and the results are actually uh, less good compared to this uh, model. So the controller actually truly optimized for skip connection and size of filters and so on. Um, so uh, one thing that I'm really uh, very interested in is not only doing on CIFA, but also on ImageNet. And ImageNet is, because ImageNet is considered to be one of the uh, holy grail in computer vision, I would say. And uh, when we try, uh, did the back, back of envelope calculation, uh, when we tried the method on ImageNet, we found out that it's too expensive. It would take months to get the result. And uh, so we, the, we came up with a different scheme uh, to uh, uh, reduce the cost. So instead of um, running neural architecture search to find the configuration for the entire uh, neural network, we find a layer. And then once we have the layer, we can actually replicate it many times um, uh, on a bigger data set. So here's the way it works. So on the left, you see an architecture that we manually constructed for uh, CIFAR 10. And each, uh, in this uh, network, we have two kind of cells, normal cell and reduction cell. 
So normal cell is like a normal layer, and reduction cell is like a pooling layer. And then we want to run this architecture search on CIFAR 10 uh, data set. And once we found a good cell, a good normal cell and reduction cell on CIFAR 10, uh, we will replicate it many times uh, on uh, ImageNet. Uh, basically, the number of N here going to get increased, and we're going to end up with a bigger neural network, and then we are going to execute it on ImageNet. So that way, we don't have to spend a lot of time inventing architectures directly on ImageNet. Um, so the, when we ran this uh, method on CIFAR 10, uh, we discover uh, the following two cells. So the first cell is the normal cell that have HI minus 1 and HI, and basically have a bunch of combination method to arrive as HI plus 1. So you can think of this as like an inception cell, but it's a little bit more complicated. And uh, it's something that I would not uh, uh, be able to figure it out myself. And um, then another cell that it, uh, this is basically the pooling layer. The pooling layer is basically taking HI minus one and HI, and then also perform a bunch of uh, combinations to give rise to HI plus one. So these two cells are being searched by neural architecture search. And once we're done with that, we're gonna stack the cells uh, many, 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 many times. So you construct a much deeper neural network on ImageNet and train it to the end with, uh, you know, for, for the entire week. Now, one nice thing about this is that we can decide how big uh, the, the network on ImageNet we can use. We can stack up, uh, for example, if n equal to three, we have a very small ImageNet model. And if n equal to 100, you end up with a huge uh, uh, deep model. And uh, that's a flexibility that we can play with. And um, OK, so um, in summary, when we applied it uh, to um, uh, CIFA 10, uh, well, the best network when n equals to 7, if this is n equal to 7, um, using the cutout uh, method, we achieved 2.4% error rate um, on CIFAR 10. And I think this is the best accuracy uh, published um, um, uh, up to date. Uh, I think there, there must be some uh, other uh, equivalent accuracy somewhere uh, on some other paper, but they aren't published. And this is probably the, the latest best so far. Um, uh, Again, when we apply the layer on ImageNet, uh, we can play around with how many times we can stack up the neural network. So for, the, for example, if we stack up n equal to four, you have a very small neural network. And on this uh, axis, uh, on the x axis, I plot uh, the size of the model uh, in terms of uh, num number of operations. Uh, so smaller is better. And on the y-axis, I plot the uh, top one accuracy, so higher is better. So the best is trying to go to all the way to the top left corner of this figure. And as you can see, uh, the network that uh, we found actually better than the, uh, the skyline, uh, the, the models that invented by human experts. And uh, including like the SENS, which is basically the best model people have found so far. And I think that this is, uh, in terms of accuracy, we are on par, but in terms of uh, uh, size, we are a lot smaller. And similarly, in terms of number of parameters, we are also a lot smaller than the state-of-the-art neural networks that human found. Uh, we also uh, transfer the architectures that we found to the uh, data set called the COCO data set. This is another holy grail data set in computer vision for object uh, detection. Uh, so uh, I th um, at the time when we applied it, the state of the art uh, is around 39%. Um, uh, using a complicated loss function, and we didn't use it, but the NASNet model that we found was able to uh, achieve 4% better uh, than the state of the art. And 
um, four percent better in uh, mean average precision is a huge improvement in accuracy of this model. Uh, so uh, we also open source the NASNet model, so you can actually uh, download the model uh, and uh, use the pre-trained weights for your problem uh, and uh, replicate some of the results in the paper. And um, yeah, I, uh, I can stop there and uh, take questions. Thank you. Amazing work. Um, I was wondering how can we further reduce the search space because 800 GPUs is a bit too much. <laughs> uh, do you have any thoughts on the future work? How can we further take it down so that we don't all have to use 800 GPUs? Okay, so uh, I think there have been uh, active research on how uh, on trying to reduce um, uh, the uh, com computational complexity of this. Uh, um, Problem, uh, of this approach, and I've seen uh, Frank Hutter, like the previous speaker, he was talking about using learning curve prediction. That's one area that like uh, uh, very promising because if you predict what model uh, is doing badly, you can queue it off very quickly. Um, I think uh, Kevin Murphy and friends are looking into uh, some way to do progressive uh, architecture search. So basically, the, instead of like doing massive architecture search right away, you kind of do curriculum training. Um, I think uh, this is also, you know, Barrett is also a co-author of this paper, and uh, I think that that can be quite promising. The other idea that uh, a lot of people been around and is the idea of using um, multitask. If you have a lot of data sets, right? Uh, as humans, we don't ever want to start from scratch. Every time we have a new uh, problem we basically use some knowledge in previous task. And I think, uh, I think like Risto kind of talked about it like in early talks. So some, some of those, uh, some combination of those ideas that can actually get you a further reduce um, computational complexity of this uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question. Um, as you know that over here in NIPS, again, we have one symposium focusing on interpretability interpretability. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of approach, you know, uh, uh, for example, as you've shown that we can reduce 1% of the test error, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as you've shown the example of cells, the normal cell and another cell, mm -hmm. uh, we could not interpret them. So what is your take on that? I, I mean, in opinion, uh, although we can reduce the test error, but it's quite hard to interpret such kind of models. So which direction would you like to, you know, uh, okay, so maybe we can have like an objective, fun uh, like another objective function uh, in the uh, reward function for interpretability. Okay. And uh, maybe the, <laughs> the best way to do this is uh, connect it to the NIPS system so that every time you come up with a new model, you can submit a paper to NIPS. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, like uh, in reality, we've been thinking about this problem a lot. Um, we don't have good answers. I think they are as complex. Uh, as any other deep learning systems, unfortunately, but uh, it's an area that we've been spending time thinking about too. So one way to do it is to regularize the grammar so to make sure that the grammar is something that, for example, ResNet is an idea that people like a lot. It's because not only because it works well, but it has some regular structure um, uh, in the grammar. So maybe we can uh, like enforce some grammar. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much for amazing research. Mm. Unfortunately, not all of us can repeat your experiments <laughs> due to computational limitations. Uh, my question is, uh, what, how you deal with other hyperparameters that are not handled by the recurrent neural net? So you have to predict them, layer configuration, but what do you do with learning rate, learning rate batch sizes? Okay, uh, so the question is how do you uh, handle, how do we handle the hyperparameters in the system? So uh, it turns out that it's uh, quite easy to make this whole system not work. Um, uh, uh, the, the idea here is to make the system work. And uh, one thing that we, uh, a few things that I, we, uh, we do, and we actually wrote it in the paper too, is that number one is that we don't, uh, yeah, we don't uh, predict the learning rate. So the learning rate, uh, if, you, if you were to allow the, system, the controller to predict the learning rate, it would predict 
the smallest learning rate possible. It will predict the smallest learning rate possible so that if you train it in a short time, the smallest learning rate will actually win. We also make sure that all the models in the system actually have very similar number of parameters so that uh, otherwise the, 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 the reward function will prefer the networks that is the smallest because it's going to be trained faster. So those things that we enforce. So the other thing that we did was we uh, copied some of the most, mo uh, the best the state of the art reci training recipes in ImageNet or CIFAR 10. So for example, data augmentation, we copy uh, like the white ResNet uh, recipe. Uh, the, uh, we have this cosine learning rate uh, by Frank and uh, colleagues. Uh, so we basically like copy a bunch of recipes that exist in. We didn't do anything fancy there. Presumably, if you want to like, take the controller and predict those hyperparameters, you, it's possible too. But the point that I'm trying to make is uh, uh, accept existing um, hyperparameters and then just invent uh, new architectures. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So yeah, my apologies that we're kind of running over time, so sorry about that. Um, hopefully we can catch you after.